I've turned on a new learning module for you. It's over gear kinematics. We're going to study the geometry of gears and the way they move and why they're designed the way they are, in particular the teeth, so that we can understand them better, so that when we get to the other chapters where we're designing gears, we understand why the shape of the tooth and so forth is so necessary, despite some of the problems it causes. We'll start off with our demotivational pro poster, uh, Worth. Just because you're necessary doesn't mean you're important. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a chuckle at these times. So we're going to study kinematics of gears, and we're covering Chapter 8 at this point. Uh, gears are governed by the American Gear Manufacturers Association, or AGMA, and there's a web link there for you. Uh, you can also get the data for gearing, the standard gearing uh, geometry from Machinery's Handbook, if you, you have one. There's some terminology you really need, though, when it comes to gears. When we talk about two gears that are in mesh, we usually refer to one of the elements as the gear and the other as a pinion. And typically, the smaller gear is the pinion, and the larger element is the, the gear itself. Now, the, the speed of the two elements are given the symbols n sub g and n sub p, where the n's are lowercase n's, not uppercase. So n sub p goes with the number of, t I'm sorry, with the speed of the pinion, and n sub g is the speed of the gear. If it's a capital N sub p or a capital N sub g, we're talking about something different then. We're not talking about the speed of the gear, we're talking about the number of teeth on the gear, or in the case of capital N sub p, the number of teeth on the pinion. Now, there is a relationship between the speeds. Uh, or this, I should say the speed ratio of the gear to the pinion and the number of teeth. And you can see it there. It's the speed of the pinion over the speed of the gear equals the number of teeth on the gear divided by the number of teeth on the pinion. So you notice there's an inverse relationship there. The more teeth a gear has, the slower it goes, basically, uh, by comparison to the, the other mating gear or pinion. So you can solve for anything you like from this equation. The speed of the gear, for example, if you know the speed of the pinion and the number of teeth on each, you can figure out how fast the gear moves. Now, if the gear doesn't move at that speed, teeth are being sheared off somewhere. So, you know, hopefully things are following this equation. There's some other terminology if you look at the figure on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, there's the outside diameter of the gear or pinion, and that's at the very top of the, the teeth, the, the diameter there. Uh, in this case, let's see, this pinion has 11 teeth, so capital N sub P is 11. Uh, the pitch circles are really important. Uh, bit of geometry to recognize. You notice that the pitch circle on the pinion and the gear are touching each other at one point. And the only real reason for having teeth on the gear is to ensure, uh, well teeth on the pinion and the gear, is to ensure that there's consistent relative motion between the pinion and the gear. That, you know, if you imagine these as two cylinders rolling on each other instead, they could slip because it would only be friction that would keep the two uh, speeds related to one another. But with teeth, Unless the teeth break off, you're guaranteed to have a, a speed relationship between the pinion and the gear. So the pitch circles are very important because they represent the same size cylinders that would give you the same or the effective gear ratio that the pinion and the gear give you. The distance between the centers of the two gears is called the center distance, nothing complicated there. And where the two cylinders I mentioned touch is called the pitch point. Uh, so that's all that we have here. There, there's a lot more to it. Um, you'll notice that the gear here has 18 teeth, so capital N sub G is the number of teeth on the gear. Now, uh, spur gears are a particular kind of gear. They're the, one of the simplest. Uh, they just have straight teeth. So if you look off to the right, you see this sort of bronze, brown colored gears that are animated there. Those gears are spur gears. The teeth on those gears are parallel to the axis of the gear itself. Helical gears, on the other hand, have teeth that are at an, that are at an angle. And so they're at an angle to the, the center line of, of the gear. Um, now, there are some advantages to helical gears. Um, one of the things that happens when the, the gear teeth mesh, if you look at the mesh there that's animated, you'll notice that the full tooth does not mesh at the same time. There's a gradual... Uh, engagement of each tooth. And what that does is it makes for smoother engagement, it makes for quieter uh, gears, it actually reduces the stress on the teeth. 
course, the, the difficulties here are that, number one, they're harder to make, so they're more expensive gearing. Uh, the other thing that you may not realize at this point is that it creates a thrust load on the shaft. In other words, these gears, while they're meshing together, they're trying to go out of mesh. Now, I will frequently use my hands as gear teeth, my, or my fingers as gear teeth, so you can understand. But if this is the teeth of two gears in mesh, what's happening is, with helical gears is there's literally an axial force trying to push them out of mesh. So basically, as the gears mesh, they're trying to push each other along the length of the shaft so that they can go out of mesh. So that's one of the, the bad byproducts of uh, helical gear teeth. Uh, if you've ever driven a manual transmission, you've probably dealt with helical and spur gear teeth. Uh, it turns out that the forward gears are typically, uh, now this is not an automatic or a continuously variable transmission, but a classic manual transmission. The forward gears um, are typically helical gears and the reverse gears are spur teeth or spur gear teeth. And that's kind of interesting because if you ever notice when you put it in first and second and third and so forth, it sound, the transmission sounds quiet, but when you put it in reverse, the transmission whines. You might wonder why. Well, it turns out that as those spur gear teeth are meshing, there's a little bit of clearance, and they're, they're not made perfectly, and so there's a little bit of banging between the teeth, basically, and that's the noise you're hearing uh, as your car is moving in reverse. Bevel gears are a little bit different. You see those at the bottom. And here, typically, the shafts are perpendicular to each other, though that doesn't have to be the case. That, by far, though, is the most common. Uh, and the teeth here are on the surface of a cone. Now, the typical application for bevel gears is to turn a corner to make the shaft change angle. And typically, you also include some gear reduction in that uh, process. Because a lot of times, what you end up with is prime movers that move fairly fast with fairly low torque, and you need relatively high torque, and so you, you reduce the speed. Worm and worm gearing is another type of, of gear. You'll see an animation off to the side there, and a lot of people will look at that rotating uh, threaded element and call that the worm gear, and that's not the case. That is actually called the worm. Uh, the more traditional looking gear item is the gear itself. It's the worm gear. So the worm is that long cylinder, and the gear is the thing that looks like a gear. Uh, the worms, in this case, typically drives the gear uh, the worm does have a spiral type thread, and typically these are used where you need large speed reductions. There are several different types, but we'll get to that here in a minute. I guess I advanced a little too quickly. There's also another type of gear called a rack, and a rack is interesting. It's just a flat, straight gear, so it's kind of like a gear with an, an infinite diameter or infinite radius. Uh, the tooth profile on a rack is a little different than what you might expect. The, Tooth profile on a standard gear is an envelope profile. On a rack, they're actually a trapezoid, and that's just because of the geometry. Um, I'll explain more about the tooth geometry later, but for right now, just know that. But they mesh perfectly. That's, that's the actual shape you need on a rack is a, uh, a tooth that's a trapezoidal shape. All right, so a little bit more terminology on gears. Um, the pitch circle is really important. A lot of these dimensions are related to the pitch circle. So again, re let me refresh your memory. You see the pinion on the top and the gear on the bottom, and you see the two uh, pitch circles that are meshing or touching at the pitch point. Now moving along the pitch point on the gear to the left and down, you'll notice that there's a couple of different dimensions there. There's P and T. I'm not sure if you can read them or not. Uh, look in your book if you can't. Um, but P and T, P is called the pitch. It's the circular pitch because that dimension is not measured straight from those two points on the two adjacent gear teeth. That pitch is actually measured along the pitch circle, so it's, it's along the arc. It's a, an arc length is what it really is. And then T is the tooth thickness, but you notice that the tooth shape varies, right? I mean, it's thinner at the top and thicker at the bottom. So the tooth thickness is defined to be the, the width of the tooth along the pitch circle. And again, that is not, you, you couldn't measure it with calipers. You'd, you'd get a number that's too low because, uh, you know, for, in the first place, you'd have to find where the pitch circle's at, which is hard enough as it is. But the other thing you'd have to do is measure along the arc there. And, uh, of course, calipers measure straight line and distance. The space between adjacent teeth is also measured along the pitch circle. And you might at first think that the tooth spacing would be equal to the thickness of one tooth. 
along the pitch circle, but it turns out there's actually some extra space because when you have gear teeth meshing with each other, it turns out that the gear teeth don't just roll on each other, they also slide. It's sort of a cam action. And so it's actually necessary to have oil on the surface of the gear teeth so they don't wear each other out. You want the oil to separate the gear teeth and transmit the load through the oil as much as possible. It's not a, a thick coating of oil, but it certainly reduces the friction and, and therefore the wear on the teeth. Uh, so the tooth space is actually typically a little bit larger than the thickness of the tooth along the root or not the root circle, pardon me, along the pitch circle. Now continuing on down uh, to the left, you'll notice that there's an outside circle indicated there. That's the outside diameter. Of course, it's always greater than the, the pitch diameter. And you'll notice some other items. I'll point them out with the mouse. There's the diameter of the gear. Now when we say diameter gear alone, what we're talking about is the diameter of the pitch circle of the gear. So if I ever say diameter of the gear without qualification, I mean the pitch circle. You'll also see DOG the outside diameter of the gear, so it's not dog, it's diameter outside of gear, and DRG, the diameter at the root of the gear. Now, moving back up and to the right, you'll see a couple of dimensions. The first one here, A, is called the addendum. It's the distance from the top land down to or between the top land and the pitch circle. And also the dedendum, which is given the symbol B, lowercase b. That's the distance from the root of the teeth up to the pitch circle. Uh, you'll notice that B looks like it's a little bigger than A. That's the case. Usually the difference between those two is the clearance, which is given the, the letter C as its symbol. HK and HT, I always struggle to remember their names, but HK, if I remember right, is the working depth. And that basically is the depth of the tooth over which you expect to have a mesh, where you expect the other teeth to actually touch. And then HT is the total height, or the, the height of the tooth. I may be wrong on that one. You, you want to go and look this all up in your book. And there's a real nice table that shows you the equations for how these are related to one another. So I do recommend that. On the pinion, there's also the root diameter of the pinion, DRP the outside diameter of the pin, and then, and then the diameter of the pinion is the pitch diameter. So those are common geometric uh, uh, numbers and dimensions important for the, the gear geometry. Um, the shape of the tooth is a very special shape. It's called an involute. And here's a quick bit of trivia for you. If you ever enjoyed Legos and played with Lego techniques, or when I was a kid it was expert builder, they have gears in, in these Legos, and these ge the gears actually have an involute profile for the tooth. If you look at them close, you'll notice that. But why do we need this? Well, look at the animation on the right, and what you'll notice is that the contact point between the two mating gears is moving to the right, right? So it's getting closer to the center of the right-hand gear and farther away from the center of the left-hand gear. And you might look at that and say, well, you know, if that mesh point were between the centers of the two gears. It was just on a line constantly between the centers of the two gears. What would happen is the effective lever arm lengths of the two gears would change and so the relative speed ratio between the two gears would change and that would be horrible. That would cause a lot of vibration because imagine one gear turning at constant speed and the other gear you know it's it's basically uh, it's, its moment arm is, is changing and so the the rate at which it moves has to change. It would, as each tooth meshed, the gear would have to speed up and slow down along that length of tooth engagement. And that'd be horrible. That would, the gears would eat themselves up very quickly. Uh, so the involute shape actually is a special geometric shape that causes the, the effective gear ratio between the two gears to remain constant. And at first it seemed kind of like black magic, but it's not, it's just motion. And the, the way to understand this, consider the figure in the center of the, um, the slide here. And what we're looking at is what's called the base circle of the two gears. And the base circle is a, the, well, there are two constructions for actually creating the involute shape. Effectively, what they do is they make it as if you had two spools that were the size of the base circles and you had string around, wrapped around one spool and then also around the other and as you turn say the lower spool, that smaller one counterclockwise, the upper one turns clockwise and of course string or, 
or yes, let's call it string, is being played off of the upper spool and wrapped up onto the lower spool. Well, it would make sense that the velocity of the string is the same at both contact points, and therefore the, the relationship between the speed of the two spools, the angular speed, would be the, the same. It would be constant. So that's what the, this involute shape does. It literally moves the touching point between the two gear teeth along an imaginary line that means the speed ratio remains constant. Now, if, if that contact point literally remained on a line between the two centers, the speed would have to vary, but that's not the case. I don't know why my animation stopped, but anyway. Uh, instead, what happens is that that point uh, actually moves vertically as well as between the centers, and so the, uh, the speed remains constant. A, a side effect of the involute shape is that there is rubbing between the teeth. They don't just roll on each other. And so lubrication is always, always required with gear teeth because of this. You don't want there to be any friction along the surface of the teeth, and we often assume that there is none. Uh, you want there to be oil in that gap in order to transmit the load and to prevent any friction. And that results in teeth that don't wear as quickly. Oh, there we go. I started up again. So again, you can see how this point is not just moving from between left and right, it's also moving up to down, and so it's uh, moving along that, that special line, that blue line there that is also this line here, and means that the gear ratio remains constant. So the, the involute shape is a little bit difficult to make, uh, but, and well, and it also causes some problems, but it's, it's worth the cost. So to get two gears, or a gear and a pinion, to mesh, the, the size of the teeth have to be the same, or basically the pitch, the distance between the teeth has to be the same. And so this determines tooth size. Now, there's a little more geometry here that we haven't mentioned so far. The face width of the teeth it can be seen in this view. It's more of a three-dimensional view. The top land I've been referring to is here, and of course the bottom land is near the root of the tooth. The area of the tooth above the pitch circle is called the face, and below it's called the flank, but you won't hear me use those terminologies a whole lot. You can see the clearance circle and the clearance dimension here, and we gave that the symbol C. You can see the addendum, which we gave the symbol A. You would think that the dedendum would have the symbol D, but it's not, it's B. And you can see how the dedendum is typically, well, as far as I know, always larger than the addendum. Uh, there's a video you should watch at this point. It's one of the required videos. It's from SME. It's only about, I think, two, two and a half minutes long. And it's a real nice animated view of a gear with these dimensions coming on the screen where they're basically announced. And so you can see which is which very easily there. So you might want to just pause this lecture at this point and go watch that video and then come back. It's required anyway. To specify the size of the tooth, you might think that the easiest way to do it would be to use that pitch, right? That distance between the same point on adjacent teeth. And to calculate the, that distance, the way you do it is you use the diameter, the, the pitch diameter of the, the element, divided by the number of teeth and multiplied by pi. And it doesn't matter whether you use the, the pinion or the gear, you'll get the same circular pitch. And the units of it would be inches. Now, this is not commonly used. It used to be more common, but it's not very common at all nowadays. What's used instead is something called the diametral pitch. And at first, it's a little confusing to understand, but the, the diametral pitch is what's actually being shown in this figure, which, by the way, is also in your book. And I'd recommend you go there and kind of wrap your head around it for a little while to understand this. Diametral pitch at first seems confusing, but once you understand that it's just a definition, you understand what it means, it's actually pretty simple. It's really the number of teeth divided by the pitch diameter of the gear or pinion. What does that mean? Well, you can think of it as how many teeth there are per each inch of diameter. So maybe your gear is six inches in diameter, okay? For each inch, how many teeth go with that inch? And we want to spread out all the teeth. We want to divide them up amongst all of the, the inches, right? And so standard diametral pitches are integer numbers. So there's an integer number of teeth per inch of diameter. So um, the units of diametral pitch are just inverse inches. In fact, it looks a lot like cir circular pitch. It just doesn't have pi in it, and it seems to be sort of an inverse. We have number of teeth over diameter rather than the other way around. There, in fact, is a relationship between the two, and that is if you multiply the 
diametral pitch of a gear by that gear circular pitch, you'll just get pi. Um, metric gears use something a little different. They use something called the metric module, and it's more like a circular pitch, but without pi. If you imagine, it'd be difficult to specify a gear based on circular pitch, because you'd always have to round it off, right? Well, the metric module gets around that problem by not including pi in the number in the first place. So it's just the diameter divided by the number of teeth. And I'm not as fond of this when I under understand. It's kind of nice that it has units of length, it has units of millimeters, but I, I struggle to understand exactly how you would, I guess it's millimeters of diameter per tooth is the way you could think about it. But that seems strange to me, I guess, because I'm used to the diametral pitch. So one thing interesting about the diametral pitch that you'll notice is as the number gets smaller, the size of the tooth gets larger. And that at first is somewhat counterintuitive. But it makes sense, right? I mean, if you have, if diametral pitch is the number of teeth per inch of, of diameter, well then if you have one inch of diameter and just one tooth that goes with it, that's a pretty darn go doggone big tooth. So you notice that the smallest, or the, the smallest in number we have, and therefore the biggest tooth, is a diametral pitch of four in, in this figure at least. So that would be four teeth per inch, um, per inch of diameter. And as the number goes up, you see that the size of the teeth goes down. The metric module is kind of nice in the sense that as the metric module goes up, the size of the tooth goes up. So that's something nice about it. There is a relationship between the metric module and the diametral pitch. Um, standard American or English gears have integer diametral pitches. Standard metric gears have integer metric modules. Uh, so this conversion between the two is more of a, 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 a length conversion factor. Uh, you can't take a metric gear and mesh it with an American gear. And you can't, uh, I suppose you could, but they'd probably laugh at you if you asked an, an American manufacturer of gears to make a gear that was some odd, you know, non-integer diametral pitch. They might not even have the tooling to do it for you. If you're trying to make it match with a, a or mesh with a metric gear. You just specify it as a metric gear if that's what you need. So metric and English gears don't match, but mesh, but there is a geometrical relationship between the two. And sometimes if you're changing over, say, from English gears to metric gears or vice versa, it's nice to know about what diametral pitch a metric module represents. In fact, in your book, there's a table that has um, some conversion between those two. Not, not necessarily, I think there's one with actual conversion, but there's also one that shows you what the nearest size equivalent tooth would be. One thing to understand about these gear teeth, as I said, is that the total pitch is m more than two times the thickness of the tooth. In other words, there's some distance between adjacent teeth that is bigger than the thickness of the mating tooth. You can see that here in this animation. Apparently, the lower gear is driving the upper gear. Uh, obviously, the lower gear is turning clockwise in this view, and the upper gear is turning counterclockwise. But this extra space is useful because it allows for manufacturing clearances, allows for oil to get in there and lubricate the teeth, which is absolutely required. Um, but it causes a problem because it, what if the lower gear went from turning clockwise to counterclockwise, and the upper gear was controlling something that was position sensitive? Well, as the lower gear moves, it's going to come out of mesh or stop touching the, the tooth to the right and start touching the tooth to the left. And since there's some clearance, it, there's going to be some lost motion in there. And especially in robots, that's a problem. Now, there are gear systems that are more advanced than what we're studying here that have either theoretically or actual zero backlash. But we're not going to study them. and just, You just need to know that backlash is something that exists with standard gearing. All right, the pressure angle. After tooth size, the pressure angle is probably one of the most important uh, things to specify in a gear. Um, the, the pressure angle really has to do with the direction of the normal coming off the tooth. If, if you have point contact between two teeth, and those two teeth are not flat, right? There's just point contact. There must be some surface normal. And it turns out, because of the way that we... we do this and the fact that the, the contact point moves along that line, there's an angle of that line called the pressure angle relative to just what you would expect, which is a, you know, a horizontal line between the two equivalent rolling cylinders. So that pressure angle is a constant angle and it's something that can be specified. It used to be that this was a 14 and a half, a fairly shallow 
pressure angle, but those gears are obsolete. Nowadays we use 20 and 25 degree pitch angles, or I'm sorry, pressure angle, excuse me. Um, the pressure angle does affect the strength of the tooth, it affects interference and how much force is applied to the shafts and so on, but um, even though it looks like having a higher pressure angle would be bad, um, it turns out that what you're really doing is you're putting more force down into the root of the tooth rather than trying to just bend the tooth off, and so it's, it's worth the, the trade-off. All right, now, the contact ratio is another number that's important. It's just basically how many teeth can be in mesh at one time so that they share the load. Uh, it's recommended that you have at least 1.2 teeth in mesh at all time. Obviously, you can't have a partial tooth in mesh. So what that means is sometimes one tooth would have the load on its own, and much of the time, or some of the time, multiple teeth would be sharing the load, at least two. But it's fairly common to have a value of about 1.5 for the contact ratio. And there's an equation on page 285, is equation 810, I've repeated it here, uh, for, the, um, for calculating the contact ratio. Now, interference is something that can occur, and it's more typically something that occurs when you have a very small number of teeth on the pinion or a very large number of teeth on the gear, or in other words, a rack, because a rack is theoretically a gear with an infinite number of teeth. Uh, what ends up happening is there's a lot of, of angular motion of the pinion while the gear undergoes very low angular motion. And so what ends up happening is the tooth kind of digs in from the gear to the, the pinion because the pinion's moving so much. Uh, trying to illustrate that with my fingers. Hopefully you see what I'm saying. But from the graphic here, you can see how the teeth have to be so-called undercut to make sure that the gear teeth don't dig into the root of the pinion teeth. And that strengthens, or pardon me, that weakens the pinion teeth at a very critical point. Basically, the, you can think of these pinion teeth as sort of like a cantilevered beam. And you all know from strength of materials that the, the highest stress is due to the moment, right? And it's at the, the root of the cantilevered beam. And so what's going on here is the, the point where there's highest stress is where we're taking away excess material, and that's, that's a bad thing. Now, there are some recommendations that you can follow. They're on page 287, table 8-7, that recommend the minimum number of teeth for the pinion based on how many teeth are in the gear. And that, if I remember right, there's two different pressure angles. I think it's 20 and 25 degree there. Um, but look at that, and it's a page worth marking in your book, and I'm sure I'll mention that in the example problems. The velocity ratio is just the speed ratio of the gear and the pinion. You'll notice it's the speed of the pinion over the speed of the gear. And so typically we think of the pinion as driving the gear. That's the most common situation because most of the time prime movers need to be geared down. They move fast but with small torque, and you don't want as much speed as they offer, you want more torque most of the time. Pardon me. And so uh, our velocity ratios, uh, if they're greater than one, uh, will be a speed reducer. And that's, that's the most common scenario where you have a small pinion on a motor, for example, and a large pinion on a, a machine that's being driven by the motor. And so the speed of the pinion is greater than the speed of the gear in that case, and the velocity ratio will be greater than one. The velocity ratio can be calculated based on several different things. Starting on the left, you can calculate it as a ratio of angular velocities in radians per second, for example. Uh, the next term over, the ratio of, of speeds in P over NG, is typically referred to in RPM rather than radians per, per time. R over R, RG over RP is the ratio of the radii of the gear and the pinion. Notice that we've intentionally flipped them, right? That we had pinion on top, gear on bottom. Now we've got gear on top, pinion on bottom. That's correct. That's on purpose. Or the diameter of the gear over the diameter of the pinion or the number of teeth on the gear over the number of teeth on the pinion. So that's how you can calculate the velocity ratio. Now, a lot of times it's not adequate to have just two gear pairs, so just two gears in mesh. Because what ends up happening is you need a higher speed reduction than one set can practically provide. And so it's, it's fairly common to have what's called a gear train. And in a gear train, you frequently will have uh, multiple shafts and multiple gears along that shaft that continue the speed reduction. 
I bought a drill from Harbor Freight. And a lot of things you buy from some of these discount stores are uh, not the best quality, but this drill is one of the best I've ever had. My father had one like it back when I was a kid. It was a Black & Decker. It looked like they had taken a power saw motor, geared it down like crazy, and put a half-inch chuck on the end. This thing is amazing. It's got a handle on the back, a handle off to the side, and, of course, the trigger handle. And uh, when you turn the thing on, you, I mean, you can put a paddle in it and mix drywall mode with it if you want to. It's so strong, and it, it can take the load no, no trouble. Well, I love this drill because a lot of times what people don't know when they're drilling holes is you don't need high speed, low force. What you need is a lot of force pushing the drill into the metal and low speed to cut the metal out. If you're making metal dust, you're doing it wrong. You should be making metal chips. So I love this drill because it's geared down so far. It's got a, a, a long gear train so that a relatively powerful motor with this gear train can generate just a tremendous amount of torque. Uh, as I said, my father had a Black & Decker version of this drill, and I'm pretty sure the drill I've got from Harbor Freight is a knockoff of that. The casing and everything looks just like it. But the drill, he, ga he actually gave it to me uh, years ago, and the Black & Decker drill gave, gave up the ghost. It died on me. It wasn't that the motor gave off. There was a switch on the back of it to change the forward and reverse direction of the motor. Well, Harbor Freight has actually fixed that. The Harbor Freight drill is even better. I love the thing, because they put the, the selector switch for forward and reverse on the trigger. Now, at the recording of this video, it turns out they're clearancing them out. One of the best things I've ever seen them sell, and they're not going to sell them anymore, I guess. So I went and grabbed one, so I've got it back up. Um, but if you want a good drill, you can get one right now at, at Harbor Freight. Anyway, uh, so it's pretty common to require very high torque, and so getting that high torque in one set is not really practical. And so... Um, you can calculate, instead of a velocity ratio, you can calculate what's called a train value. It's basically the input speed over the output speed of the train. And so we typically, by convention, will use a positive train value when we indicate that the input and output are rotating in the same direction. We'll use a negative value when they rotate in opposite directions. And uh, the way you can calculate a train value based on the number of gears, uh, gear teeth, is by the, the multiplying the number of teeth in the driven gears by... Uh, together and then dividing by the, the product of all the number of teeth in the driving gears. So it's a pretty simple equation. Now I've included an animation over here and I'm not sure that the gear teeth actually are remaining in mesh perfectly for this animation. But you'll notice we got gear A, B, and C and that gear A and C rotate in the same direction. Gear B in this case would probably be an idler gear. Now it could be where power is actually coming in, but let's just pretend for the moment that power is coming out on gear A and going out on gear C. Unless you had idler gear B, uh, A and C would have to rotate in opposite directions. Now it turns out that the number of teeth on B is not all that critical. The number of teeth on B will not affect the gear ratio between A and C. Now there are some problems with the stresses applied to gear B's teeth. It's actually a fairly highly uh, the gear B is being more abused right now, let's say. Okay, it's under a lot more stress. Um, but I'll explain that once we talk, start talking about stress in gear teeth. But this is one way to change the direction of the train value. Just add in a, um, an idler gear intermediate. If you want to see some interesting gear trains and you have an old inkjet printer laying around, take it apart and you will find all kinds of fascinating gear trains. Gear trains for feeding paper, where when they rotate the motor in one direction, a certain segment of the gear train activates and some of the gears are movable, so that when the motor rotates in the opposite direction, other gears are engaged and changes the speed or properties of the, the, the paper feed. Really fascinating. You should take one apart if you ever have the opportunity.